well, regulated militia being necessary to the security of a free state, the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. Welcome to another edition of Bearing Arms, Cam and Company. My name is Cam Edwards. I am glad you're with us on the program today. Uh, my friend Steven Gutowski from The Reload is going to be with us here in just a moment or two, talking about um, some of the big stories that we're seeing, uh, specifically... Some of the recent attacks we are seeing on modern sporting rifles. Uh, we got the New York Times story we talked about yesterday going after uh, ammunition produced at Lake City. Uh, Rolling Stone <laughs> with a another hit piece on uh, modern sporting rifles in the firearms industry. You will be uh, surprised to learn that according to Rolling Stone, um, the reason why you have an AR-15 or a modern sporting rifle is, is because of the greed of the firearms industry. That's right. It's not because of your wants, your desires, or your right to keep and bear arms. Oh, no, no. Because of those uh, greedy gun makers out there. Uh, and of course, how do you deal with greedy individuals? Well, you sick the government on them, right? So uh, we'll talk with Stephen about that here in just a second. Before we do, let's talk about this for a moment. Biden's America. It is crushing us. You've got companies laying off tens of thousands of workers one after another. America's working two jobs just to get by. Inflation pushing hardworking families to the brink. Just look at the price of lunch. Next time you go to the grocery store, you'll know exactly what I'm talking about. And a digital dollar could be coming down the pipeline to completely destroy our way of life. The truth is, you need a plan. You know it, and I know it. And that's why you should call Gold Co. So you can diversify your savings and investments with gold and silver before things get worse. They're a six-timing 5,000 winner, 2022 Company of the Year, thousands of five-star reviews, and they've helped people like you and me place over $1 billion in gold and silver. They're offering up to $10,000 in free silver while supplies last. And if you call them today, qualified callers will get a free Ronald Reagan half-ounce silver coin. So don't wait. Call Gold Co. at 855-412-3806 today. That's 855-412-3806. And now let's turn to our conversation with the Reloads, Steam Gatowski, talking about, uh, again, the latest assault on so-called assault weapons, both in the courts and in the uh, court of public opinion. Take a look and a listen. Steven, it's good to see you again. Thanks so much for coming on the program. Absolutely. Thanks for having me. Yeah, man. So we're going to we're gonna cover a lot of ground uh, during this interview, but I wanted to start with this big New York Times story that ran over the weekend on the uh, Army, uh, Lake City Army ammunition plant. Uh, and, you know, I'm reading this, and, and, you know, you've been around long enough to know how this works as well, right? The, the, you don't see big pieces like this unless it's the start of something. Uh, and so in this report, you know, we saw the New York Times reporter uh, reach out to the Department of Defense uh, to ask questions. And one of the uh, responses that DOD gave was, we don't have any plans to to change, uh, you know, civilian ammo being manufactured here, which suggested the New York Times reporter asked, are you going to stop these sales? And it seems to be like, you know, now I'm sort of waiting for Chris Murphy or Richard Blumenthal or Dick Durbin, some member of Congress to step up and say, we need answers here, because that's usually how this goes. Do you am I off base or do you think that this, too, is sort of meant to be the opening shot of an attack on civilian ammo manufacturing at Lake City? No, absolutely. I think you're you're correct in the how this is going to play out because you know, and, and look, I don't have anything. I don't have any problem with the reporting itself. It's fine uh, to to report on these things. Uh, it's, it's part of the, the job as a reporter. But but yes, when I read the piece, I thought, okay, well, they're going to try and shut down civilian production or civilian sales of ammunition from Lake City, and and I wasn't surprised by that because they already tried to do that. Earlier this year, if you recall, um, there was an effort to uh, end civilian sales of ammunition from this army uh, ammunition factory, and it was thwarted by like, the industry got involved. Um, and there were there were here's the thing about it, you know, the, the New York Times piece frames this in the with mass shootings, right? That this ammunition is found at mass shootings, and um, I mean, this ammunition is extremely common because it's made you know it's surplus from this factory that and the idea of making that surplus is not so that civilians can have ammunition to shoot with it's it's to keep the capacity of the plant up right because if you if you were to shut down civilian sales from this plant in peacetime well you'd have to lay off a bunch of people from this plant because they wouldn't be doing anything and uh that would be detrimental when you need to ramp back up 
to production in the situation where you need to produce a lot of ammunition. So, and you know, whether that's uh, in a war that we're directly fighting or uh, for supply to Israel or Ukraine or some other ally that, that needs ammunition. And so that's, that's why it operates this way, not uh, just to sort of make civilian lives easier, but I do think that the opposition to it is because they want civilian uh, ammunition to be more expensive by choking off some of the supply that they can get at with, uh, since this is a government run facility. Yeah. I, you know, I mean, listen, I, 50 years ago, the the Holy grail of the gun control movement was a ban on handguns. Um, they've, they've put that aside. Right. I mean, you, you, we just saw, I think the Gallup poll was the most recent poll. I think it was like 22, 23% of Americans say, ah, it's ban handguns. Yeah. Um, Although it was almost half a Democrats, which is almost half a Democrat. No, absolutely. Yeah, um, but it is still a very low number overall. It, it is, and, and so I, you know, clearly, I think the the impetus right now for the gun control lobby is, well, let's ban so called assault weapons, um, and, and we'll go from there, right? And it may be that if you get a, a court to go along, a ban on modern sporting rifles could encompass a ban on all semi-automatic firearms, right? We saw the Seventh Circuit panel. Uh, basically say, well, you know, semi-automatics are like machine guns, so they're not protected by the Second Amendment anyway, which would implicate handguns as well as long guns. Um, we also saw this uh, Rolling Stone article uh, come out. I had no idea, Stephen. I thought I wanted a modern sporting rifle, and I purchased a modern sporting rifle because I, I, I wanted one. I didn't realize it was because of the greedy gun manufacturers that were, you know, foisting these firearms on people. Do you think that the Bruin decision uh, energized the gun control movement to go after uh, semi-autos in a way that maybe they were reluctant to? Like, do they see the writing on the wall that, okay, if we just stand by and we do this incremental approach, we're not going to get enough done uh, before the Supreme Court says, nope, these bans are unconstitutional. So we've got to go for bigger and bigger bites at the apple now. Uh, Again, is that something that you see happening I don't know. I mean, I, when I read that piece in, in Rolling Stone, you know, it, obviously it sort of regurgitates a lot of talking points that that have been in play for 30 years or so, right? The, the shift to going after AR-15s and AK-47s and similar firearms, that started in the 90s, right, uh, that, that you're talking about. So it's not, it's been around for a while. And a lot of the stuff in there is is along those lines. Although I did, I think they, there is some response to sort of the, um, the the major critique, the main critique that a lot of gun rights advocates have made of these assault weapons bans, which is that they're kind of targeting things that don't make the gun any more or less lethal, right, or, or dangerous or what have you, uh, but more cosmetic features that make it look more like a, a gun you would see in the military or uh, sort of ergonomic features that make it a little bit more uh, comfortable to hold for different variety of shooters uh you know people who have different lengths arm lengths and uh stuff like that you know that's where they you go after the telescoping stocks or the the hand guard or uh you know things of that nature the pistol grip and um and i think they've started to respond to that to some degree and realize that those aren't really what make the gun dangerous or 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 what have you like they go after the more functional features now which is the semi-automatic nature of the gun, the type of ammunition it fires. Um, and of course, the problem with that is when you go after the semi-automatic nature of the gun or the ammunition it fires, you're going after a much broader category of firearms that traditionally Democrats and, and gun control activists have at least said they don't want to ban things like hunting rifles um, and all sorts of other firearms uh, that don't look like military firearms. And so people don't have that same visceral reaction to them as they might with an AR-15. Yeah, no, that makes sense. Um, and and I, I think that you're right. In fact, I was talking with somebody in the industry who, uh, this was on background, so I won't name names, but um, they said they would not be surprised to see just a flat out semi-auto ban, at least for long guns. Uh, introduced in an anti-gun state like California or Illinois this next year. They, they they really feel like that's the way this is trending, at least in the gun control side. Um, and maybe that is the case. You know, I mean, we've seen states like Massachusetts try to ban not only the possession of uh, so-called assaultants, but, you know, going after the manufacturer, right? Telling Smith & Wesson, you can't make these products. So I think you're right that the definitions are broadening. Um, I mean, I, you know, I've always felt like the phrase assaultant just meant 
a gun I want to ban because there is no real definition, right? It can uh, California has changed their definition, I think, four times yeah. uh, since the late 80s. There's definitions, but they vary from state to state. Right. Like, like high capacity magazine it varies from state to state. Some states have different definition for what high capacity magazine is, depending on whether it's a handgun <laughs> magazine or a rifle magazine. So, yeah, they, they have there are definitions that you can look at, right? Which is why these, uh, you know, you see like the ATF director. Uh, during his confirmation hearing can't give you an even basic outline of what the term means. I mean, you'd think they'd have at least be able to point to one of the definitions. But yeah, the big problem is it's kind of, it's it's all over the place. It's very fluid and yeah. also up and is just whatever people want to ban. You know, I'm glad you brought up the ATF because that gives us a perfect segue. And, and by the way, Steve Dittlebach, yeah, he, he, he can define it. It's up to Congress to define what it is, but they should be banned, according to him, right? Um, right. Go figure. So the Supreme Court, we, we've dealt with Rahimi. We'll, uh, we'll we'll deal with the outcome of Rahimi here in a couple of months. But uh, the Supreme Court also granted cert to the bump stock challenge, which is not really a surprise given the splits in the appellate courts. Um, but as I was talking with you uh, off air just before we got started here, you know, I've been wondering if this is not a way, even if it's in dicta, for the court to... Uh, weigh in on these bans on assault weapons. Obviously, we've got the, uh, what is it, the Bianchi case that we're still waiting on in the Fourth Circuit. It's been almost a year since oral arguments were mm-hmm. held. Forever. Right? You've got uh, the uh, Duncan case in uh, the Ninth Circuit. You've got, obviously, the uh, Seventh Circuit cases. So there are plenty of cases out there. But bump stocks, by their very nature, are attached to modern sporting rifles. Um, you don't attach a bump stock to a bolt action, right? So this does, I think, provide the court the opportunity. I'm not saying they'll take it, but I, I also don't know if the court can avoid talking about the legality of the ATF's actions in banning bump stocks without getting into at least a little bit um, the you know legality of the firearms that the bump stocks are being attached to. So do you think that the court may start to address, maybe not answer the question once and for all, but at least uh, start to address the issue of, can you ban semi-automatic firearms by calling them assault weapons? I think that's actually a really good question because I, I would tend to think, you know, this uh, this is in a Second Amendment case. This is a case about administrative powers. And so you'd want to look at how the court has, has this court has handled administrative powers, which they've been frankly very skeptical of. He's had the EPA case last year, and so I would think the ATF is on weak footing here in this case as well. But uh, but that's on you know whether the ATF has the power to do this rule, not whether uh, the Second Amendment protects the the guns that are affected. And um, and so my my initial reaction would be it's not going to tell you a lot about the Second Amendment or or what guns can and can't be banned. Uh, from a rights standpoint. But you know what? I, I think that, you know, you've kind of persuaded me a little bit here with, yeah. with uh, this 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 question, this argument, because, you know, uh, first of all, the court can do whatever it wants. Right. <laughs> I think that's an important point. They, they have these specific questions that they take, like the, they've just took an NRA case that's a First Amendment case. And, and they're like, all right, we're taking question one, but not question two. And so that, you know, they get really, and sometimes they'll change the question slightly. They did that in Bruin, if you remember, and people Mm -hmm. were kind of worried about that. Um, And so, you know, they're supposed to just answer this question. And sometimes they seem really committed to not going too far. But you even saw this in the Rahimi oral arguments. Gorsuch was talking about, like, we don't need to answer all these questions. We just have this one thing to get to get to them. We can take other cases to answer other questions. But that's not how they always actually rule in practice, right? Sometimes they want to say something beyond the specific question that they're answering. And and I do feel like maybe this would be an opportunity to do that, especially because the lower courts have really uh, kind of dragged their feet on these assault weapons cases. The, I mean, the Fourth Circuit, the, <clears throat> the Supreme Court granted, vacated, and remanded their old ruling that upheld Maryland's assault weapons ban and said, redo this. Uh, under the Bruin standard, and the Fourth Circuit is just kind of not bothered to do it. <laughs> They're just sitting around. On they, they had oral arguments a long time ago. They haven't released uh, an opinion that can be appealed up to the Supreme Court, and so maybe the court gets impatient with that kind of thing and says something. Like you said, it they might not give you a full-on a Sullivan's ban ruling in this case, uh, but maybe they say something. I think that's actually not a bad uh, prediction. 
And, you know, even if it's not a majority of the court, I, I think uh, maybe it's more likely that a Justice Thomas or Justice Alito or Justice Gorsuch or maybe all three have concurring yeah, opinions, concurrence. right, where they kind of go on and elaborate. But you're right about the Fourth Circuit. And, you know, the one thing I'll say about the Fourth Circuit, um, technically, we don't even know whether or not the panel that heard oral arguments last December is going to rule on the merits. I don't think it's likely that they're going to kick the case back down to district court. But they could. That was one of the questions that they were considering. And if they did that after hanging out of this case for almost a year, I mean, that would be just infuriating and a clear sign that the courts are trying to play keep away from SCOTUS when it comes to some of these issues. Um, again, I, I think they are. You know? I, I, oh, I do, too. I do, too, yeah. particularly in the Ninth Circuit, as we've yep, seen, the you know, they're Circuit playing the on bond games. Um, I would like to think that it's not happened in the Fourth Circuit, in part because that's where I live. <laughs> but. <laughs> right. You know, also, I think it would be um, if you want to tick off the 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 justices on the court, you do something as egregious as that. You you hold on to one of these cases for over a year and then you say, actually, you know what? We're not qualified to decide this right now. We're going to kick it all the way down to trial court for more findings. And uh, and we'll we'll take this back up in a year or two. Um, that you know I know think- what that message is. Uh, you know what, you know what I'd take away from that? It's like, yeah. well, we're going to extend this as long as we can. Cause maybe one of these, one of these justices won't be there by the end. Of all this. Right. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I, I think that's, that's I think that is a strategy right now. I think, um, uh, there are some judges who are waiting to see how 2024 shakes out. Uh, and they are, I think, hoping that there'll be a Democrat, not only in the white house, but uh, democratic control of the Senate. Uh, so you can start confirming more uh, Democrat judges, I, you know, we'll get into the court packing uh, later, I, I guess, in the, you know, maybe later on in the election cycle. But I think that's at least a, a consideration for some of the judges that are out there in the federal judiciary right now. Uh, so this is a concern. And, you know, it, it is frustrating because justice delayed is justice denied. And you've got these, you know, outstanding issues that you know, look, I, you, I technically, I guess the, the court could, uh, you know, GVR one of these cases and then say, eh, actually, we're not going to uh, take this up again. But I don't think that's likely. I mean, I, I think we are going to hear from the court uh, on a gun ban case when one reaches the court in, you know, regular time. And yeah, yeah it's incredibly frustrating, particularly with the uh, Fourth Circuit. And the problem, uh, and I think Costas Moros has pointed this out. He's a lawyer for the California um uh, rifle and pistol association and the issue is that all these assault weapons bans are in circuits that are liberal because the only liberal states are passing these bans right. so they have total control over the pace of these these cases and they are it does seem uh to be into the idea of strategic litigation where they don't they don't they know what the supreme court is probably going to rule they don't like that and so they'll delay things as long as they could. You know, it's not like anyone was surprised by what Judge Benitez ruled when they sent the uh, assault and span back down to him to rule on it again. Right. Um, you know, the, everyone knew what was going to happen in that case. But, you know, it, and it's, it's uh, you know, strategic litigation is part of the game. That's how it works. You know, the, you look at Rahimi is strategic litigation. They picked the Biden administration picked that case because it was their best case where they had the best grounds and they're probably going to win to at least to some degree on that case. Uh, whereas range is a much harder case for them. Uh, and so they, they wanted, they said, Hey, we're going to do this case first. And then once that case got accepted, by the way, court, you should take up these other harder cases for us in light of whatever you rule in the case that we like. Um, so, you know, it's, that's, that's, how a yeah. smart litigator goes about doing this stuff. It, it It is. But strategic litigation, as you say, is normally done by the litigators or the litigants, yeah, right? True. Not judges by the not by that. the judges. Yeah. I mean, those are supposed to be the impartial figures. Uh, and and this isn't even a matter of, you know, court shopping, right? Like trying to get a case. Well, let's file a case in the district and hope that it gets assigned to Judge Benitez, because we know that, you know, he's somebody who gets the right to keep and bear arms. We're not even talking about that. I mean, we're talking about just, I think, willful action on the part of members of the federal judiciary, as I say, and as you said, to just keep these issues away from the Supreme Court until hopefully from their perspective, there is a, a court that's more amenable uh, to upholding uh, these guys. Yeah, they, they shouldn't do it, but but it does happen, I think. Yeah. All right. So what we're talking about gun control uh, here in the United States, you've been doing some really great reporting on gun control in Israel uh, and the surge in gun owners, or at least folks who are applying 
for licenses to become a gun owner in Israel. Um, what, 150,000 in, in just a few weeks, right? I mean, a tenfold yeah. increase in the number of applicants. That is really incredible. Yeah, yeah. They get about uh, 50,000 a year in a normal pace, according to Cynthia Rothman, who's the a chair of the committee in the the kids at the parliament there that oversees this process and um so you know they had three times the annual demand within three weeks basically uh so yeah really unprecedented situation and you know 150,000 keep in mind that Israel there's only about nine million I think nine and a half million people who live there so it's uh that's a that's a lot of demand and um you know it, it's really fascinating when you sort of get into the details of their gun culture there because it's very different from the united states in some ways and it's very similar in other ways uh but you know one i think people are often surprised here in the united states uh, especially gun owners by the kind of restrictions they have mm -hmm. over there because you expect you know especially you look at something like october 7th and what happened and and the, that threat is kind of always lingering over them uh in israel and so you kind of expect that they have pretty lax gun laws and that everybody's got guns and what have you but the, but israel takes a pretty different approach to that situation than we do here because yeah i mean for one to be fair like they have civilian gun ownership which is fairly rare across the globe right uh you know in the u.s we take take it as a part of our rights you know the guarantee in our constitution most of the world doesn't have that sort of thing. Yeah. And so most of the world, you can't really legally own guns unless you're politically connected or something like that. And uh, so Israel is is a bit more, uh, allows more than, than your global average does, but they're still much stricter than we are here. Uh, but at the same time, they take the approach of, of having everyone uh, required to join the military at some point. And so you get a lot of people who are in the military, in the military, either reserves or active duty, uh, on a, a higher percentage basis than what we have here in the United States or in, in a lot of countries out, around the world. So they kind of take the dual a dual approach where you have more you have civilian gun ownership, but it's more restricted. But you also have a much more active uh, military presence among the population. So it's kind of a fascinating uh, situation to look at as an American gun owner. Yeah, it is. Um, what, so what, what what's the thing that uh, surprised you the most about Israel's gun laws when you started looking into how they differ uh, from the United States? Yeah, I, I, a number of things, right? You, one, uh, you know, you have the typical stuff like they register guns. It's In some ways, it's kind of like a blue state, you know, a deep blue state would be in the United States where you have to get, you have to pay, you sort of get a gun Oh, uh, they have sorry, they have applications to buy guns. So that's not completely unheard of here, right? And they have a gun registry. Again, something you have in like Illinois or, or California or Washington, D.C. But <clears throat> they're much more strict about who's eligible to get guns. So you, in Israel, you have to live. Uh, he, Simcha has said that the most common way to qualify in Israel before October 7th was you had to live in a certain area that's considered to be more dangerous than other parts of the country. So okay. if you live in a, in a safer part of the country, you, you can't even qualify for a gun permit. Um, uh, and then additionally, you're limited to one gun. Uh, you know, we have like here in Virginia where, where we both live, you have one gun a month rule. Right. In Israel, you have one gun for your life rule. Um, I don't, <clears throat> I, I'm not entirely sure why that's the thing, but uh, that that's one of the rules. And also it has to be a handgun. You can't outside of, uh, you know, unless you have a hunting license or something along those lines, which she told me was fairly rare in Israel, mm -hmm. you can't own rifles or, or shotguns or things of that nature. You, you, the permits that we're talking about, the 150,000 people got their handgun permits. So the only option you have is handguns. And and honestly, this was something that came up when I talked to uh, Jewish Americans who were arming themselves after October 7th, because, you know, th there was some not this wasn't directed at Israel, but it was the thought of like, well, if you're really in a situation where you have several people armed, you know, terrorists coming to your home, a handgun is better than nothing for sure. But you really they all wanted something more powerful. They were all going towards the AR-15 or something of that nature. So yeah. automatic rifle. Because, I mean, that would be your, your better option in a scenario like that. So uh, it's kind of interesting that in Israel, 
you only can own handguns. And uh, but at the same time, if you get that permit to own, it's kind of like permitless carry here in the United States, where as long as you have can legally have that gun, you can legally carry it in Israel. Okay. So Interesting. they don't have a separate permit for carry. Okay. So kind of like Massachusetts, I guess, right? They've got their, it's called their license to carry, but you have to have it in order to possess a firearm even in your home right um when it comes to handguns so that is interesting i, I was struck by the uh the the ammo limitations yeah uh that you can only have i think it's 50 rounds of ammunition at a time at least that's what you're supposed to right and they expanded that i think after october 7th to yeah, up to, to double it to 100 but you know yeah again you're talking about you know one gun a month in virginia versus one gun forevermore right. that to me was really strange because and one of those you can possess that gun. It can't be like your wife or whatever else. Whoever yeah. Else. It's just one person, one gun. But one of the stories that I ran across right after the initial uh, uh, terror attacks by Hamas was a couple who were both veterans. So they both and they both, I guess, did possess uh, their handguns legally. But they fended off seven Hamas terrorists. They had put their kids in a safe room. Um, the mom and dad were ultimately killed. And the the family came and rescued the the kids later, but they were limited to the number of rounds that they had in their possession. And uh, you know, we have these conversations about you know again large capacity magazines here, and you know the state of California says ah, you don't need more than two rounds. You know that's the average defensive gun use. And it just really struck me that you know <laughs> there's no guarantee that you're going to be the average victim of a violent crime. Right. right. It may be that you, you one one person, you know, tries to bust down your uh, bust through your door like we saw in South Florida last night. Um, but it could be multiple attackers. It could be, you know, a, a group of armed assailants. Um, and so if the government can't guarantee that you're going to be the average victim of a crime. Then why should you be limited to only the average, uh, you know, response that's necessary? Right. And actually, zero rounds fired is the average defensive gun. Use well, that's true. Right? Yes. When you that's you true. By surveys. So, <laughs> that's true. Uh, you know, maybe you don't even need to have any ammunition at all <laughs> under that sort of logic. But you're right. Uh, you, the other interesting thing that I came across was sort of the attitude towards guns, at least uh, according to, to Mr. Rothman, because he he was saying, you know, there's it's not viewed as a right in Israel. That's why you have all these you have to have eligibility. You have to go through this process. Um, you know, they have background checks and they have a mental health check, uh, things of that nature. Uh, but he still view he still said that they view it as a good thing, armed civilians. Uh, he said that, you know, armed civilians in the past have stopped numerous terrorist attacks. Um, and, and so they the, the country, at least, <clears throat> you know, one, one of the top leaders of this country views this as, as uh, armed civilians as a positive thing that can help uh, stop these sorts of events. And in fact, that's been the case for a while, as according to him, that a number of the, the previous uh, secretaries who are responsible for this, you know, for civilian gun ownership have tried to encourage more people to own guns. They've opened up some of the restrictions and they've, they've sort of, they were already in the process of doing a number of these things that they've done since October 7th, but uh, they sort of accelerated that. For instance, if you've been in combat, if you're a combat veteran in Israel now, um, that you, you know, you could have lifetime eligibility for a handgun, uh, regardless of where you live. But uh, that used to be limited to just people who were in certain infantry groups. OK, and now they've they've opened that up to more uh, veterans, you know, people who were served in tanks or so, so on and so forth uh, was his explanation. So now that's probably the largest group in the, the country that can own uh, handguns or is eligible to own them. Uh, and they've tried to encourage people to actually go and apply for the permits because he said, you know, a lot, a lot, even though there's probably a million people who qualified for permits under the dangerous areas eligibility, maybe less than half of those actually get the permit. A lot of women don't get them. Um, you know, so they're, this, it's very interesting because they have this attitude that's similar to how Americans view civilian, at least gun owners in America view civilian gun ownership as, as like a positive that can help prevent, uh, you know, attacks or what have you. But at the same time, they still have these restrictions that are confusing to a, a lot of us here, I think. Um, uh, but they're they're sort of moving in the more uh, permissive direction at yeah. this point. And so it'll be interesting to see how that all ends up. Like, <clears throat> will Israel end up with a sort of Second Amendment at some point, a written 
guarantee of gun rights uh, like we have here, or will they just end up with a more European style, uh, maybe Ukrainian style? You saw similar things happen in Ukraine after the invasion. Mm -hmm. um, maybe they'll just end up with a little bit looser gun laws, but they're still closer to you know the Europeans than they are to us. I don't know. It'll be it'll be interesting to see how they move going forward here. Absolutely. Uh, well, we've got something else to talk about, I guess, the next time we get you back on the shows. But uh, in the meantime, thank you for joining me today. I would obviously encourage folks to head to the reload.com. Check out all of Stephen's work, become a subscriber, support the independent pro second amendment journalism that Stephen is doing there at the reload uh, and folks like Jake Fogelman. Uh, you've got uh, a great staff uh, that's writing for you as well. So Stephen, as always, man, great to see you. Thank you for what you do and looking forward to uh, catching up with you again very soon. Absolutely. Thanks for having me on. My thanks to Steve for joining us on the program. Looking forward to having him back again before long. Right now, let's turn our attention to today's Armed Citizen story, our recidivist report, our uh, hero of the day. We'll start with our uh, recidivist report from uh, Texas. Yeah, even in the Lone Star State, we see this stuff. 17-year-old sentenced to two years probation for a 2022 bathroom assault at Westbrook High School. This is in uh, Beaumont, Texas. Jordan Savoy uh, was tried as an adult in this case because of the severity of the attack. He was indicted on a second-degree robbery charge in December of 2022. A, a hearing to determine whether or not to be certified as an adult took place the month before, and he was certified and faced trial as an adult. Uh, Savoy ended up pleading guilty to the lesser charge of Class A assault, and he was placed on deferred adjudicated probation for two years. Now, if he violates his probation... Uh, according to local media, he could, uh, I emphasize that would, could uh, be sentenced to up to a year in jail, as well as a $4,000 fine for robbery. Uh, if convicted on the previous charge of second-degree robbery, he could have faced two to 20 years in prison and up to a $10,000 fine. Instead, not facing any jail time at all. Uh, again, unless he uh, does something to violate the terms of probation. And even then, based on what we've seen it's probably going to be a slap on the wrist. I doubt it's going to be the entirety of a sentence imposed on him. Anyway, the incident happened uh, last September uh, 2022. Campus administration notified campus police of what appeared to be an assault at the high school. Victim told campus officials that he was in the boys' bathroom. Uh, Savoy opened the stall in which he was sitting, demanded items that were in the victim's pants. Uh, after Savoy made his demands, the victim attempted to leave, kind of pulled Savoy by the shirt in the process. Investigators say the assault started when Savoy then tried to steal the items, including a cell phone from that student. There was video at the time showing the victim in a fetal position on the floor while Savoy is punching and kicking him multiple times. There were at least three different cameras that caught this assault because you had a group of teens who were standing around, not intervening, not trying to help the victim, but just filming and laughing. Uh, none of the teens, again, offered the uh, uh, victim any assistance whatsoever. At one point, you see him standing up. He's got blood on his face around one eye. Blood can be seen on the floor in the background. One of the videos, a teen can be heard after the altercation, commenting on how the boy got beat the bleep up, suggesting that he needs to go to the nurse. Savoy apparently left after the attack without offering to uh, help the victim at all. And according to the affidavit, he avoided police and campus administration for three class periods after his friends told him that cops and campus administrators were looking for him. Uh, and has managed to avoid basically any serious consequences uh, for this crime by taking the plea deal that was offered to him by prosecutors. Today's Armed Citizen story from Pompano Beach, Florida, where a, a woman shot an intruder who broke into her home. This was around uh, just after midnight on Sunday. A uh, neighbor saw the whole thing happen. She said uh, she sort of, she didn't call herself the nosy neighbor of the neighborhood, but uh, kind of sounds like it. Sharon Kerrigan said, I'm like the eye watch out here, always out here. I don't know you, I'm watching you, you know? So she was outside having a cigarette. She said that this guy came down the road, barefoot, looking behind him like somebody's after him, and he veered right, went to try her doorknob, couldn't get in that way, pulled the screen down, just started busting out the glass and called through the window. So I called 911, she said. She said she uh, thought the man was, quote, whacked out on something. Then Kerrigan heard a gunshot. A, a woman who lives inside that home, an older woman, according to Kerrigan, uh, used her firearm to defend herself. Kerrigan said, I'm glad she did. Older woman in this day and age, got to have some type of protection. Now, according to uh, NBC Miami, uh, the uh, suspect appears to have suffered non-life-threatening injuries. Police have not released his uh, identity at this point. 
Um, and I got to say, I wrote about this at Buried Arms. Based on Florida's standard ground law, I, I can't see how this woman's going to face any charges. You've got a presumption that the uh, individual in question meant to do you great bodily harm or death if they unlawfully enter your home, which was definitely the case here, the front window being smashed out. So we'll try to keep our eyes updated for uh, any eyes open for uh, any updates as they become available. But yeah, this looks like a pretty clear case of self-defense in South Florida to me. Finally today, in the right place, at the right time, we'll able to do the right thing. A police officer from not, not, not quite my own backyard, but not far away, Lynchburg, Virginia. Police officer uh, Stephen Rippey saving a family from a house fire over the weekend. Uh, he says it was towards the end of his shift. He was uh, driving around patrolling. I said this was over the weekend. It's actually on Monday, so this was uh, just yesterday. And uh, as he's patrolling, he said he couldn't believe his eyes. There was an apartment complex in Gulf and Flames that he came across. He radioed into dispatch and then acted quickly. Uh, it was sort of a, like, a, I guess, like a fourplex. It was an older home that had been converted into apartments. So this wasn't like a massive complex or anything like that. Rippy was able to uh, kick down the front door of the home. Didn't have any protective gear on at the time. He had no experience with fires. Uh, he said, you go into a house that's on fire. It's warm. I can't see anything. Your chest is getting tight. He says, I'm not trained. But once he gained entry, he met several people, alerting the rest who had not come out that their building was on fire. He said, I don't think they knew it. They were asleep. He made his way upstairs, grabbed the first person he saw, rushed them outside. Lynchburg Fire Department arrived a couple minutes after the call. Uh, and then it was a basically a team effort to uh, rescue the other people, uh, three individuals who were still inside the unit when the fire started. Lynchburg Fire Chief uh, Greg Wormser says the fire was already heavy upon arrival. Firefighters could tell it had been burning a while. Uh, Rippy said a number of thoughts ran through his mind before he kicked down the door. He said, if I open this door, am I going to be introduced with a big flame in my face? Is that what's going to happen? Am I going to go home and see my wife and kiss my kids to go to school this morning when I get home? He said, it's scary. And it is. But uh, again, in the right place, at the right time, willing and able to do the right thing. Uh, Mr. Stephen Rippy did help save some lives, and he did make it home to his family. We thank him for his very good deed. He says... Um, yeah, as a police officer, I know nothing about fire. I know fire's hot, and I don't want to be anywhere near it. But that's about the extent of my knowledge. You know, if he had known more, maybe he would have convinced himself not to go in. Too dangerous. I don't know. But I am glad that he took the action that he did, because it sure sounds like he saved some lives in the process. So, uh, Officer Rippey, we thank you very much for your very good deed. Now, that is all the time we've got for you in this edition of Bearing Arms, Cam and Company. I want to thank you for being a part of the program, as always. And I am looking forward to being back with you again tomorrow. Same bat time, same bat channel. Different Second Amendment topic, I uh, promise. Uh, if you like what you uh, see and hear during the show, I'd encourage you to check out BarionArms.com. We're updating the website throughout the day with the latest Second Amendment news and information. And I'd encourage you to become a VIP member as well. Just go to BarionArms.com slash subscribe. You can get a significant savings on your VIP membership. And we're going to give you exclusive content to say thanks for your support. Enjoy the rest of your 2A Tuesday. We'll see you back here tomorrow. Until then, be well, be safe, and be free.